I'm an infectious disease specialist, and when I go home at night to my two young children and my wife, I'm not worried that I'm going to be transmitting some deadly thing to them, even though that's what I spend all day dealing with. And so I want to highlight why this is important, how we got here and what we're doing about it, but also put it in some perspective. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about the book that I wrote, Superbugs. So a few years ago, I was trying to figure out how do I talk about this issue? Because I was getting, as an infectious disease specialist, I was getting emails from friends and family all the time about articles in the news. You've probably seen plenty of these uh, newspaper headlines of new superbug, you know, MRSA does this, or outbreak of superbug in New Mexico. But one of the things that I noticed time and time again about these articles is that there was something missing from them. And that thing that was missing was the patients. It was often a story about the bacterium, about the science behind it, which was fascinating, or about the policies that had led to this or what was being done from a policy, policy perspective to address it, kind of the 30,000 foot view. But it was missing the thing that I was seeing all the time, which was the patients who were coming into the emergency room, who were scared and who were vulnerable, and their stories weren't being told. Um, part of that is because the journalists who were writing these articles didn't have access to them. And I'm going to talk a little bit later today about that issue of writing about patients, real patients, and how that's a, a, a tricky subject. But for someone like me who writes all the time about medicine, uh, it's a, a crucial aspect of telling these stories. So a few years ago, um, I was in the emergency room of New York Presbyterian, and a patient came in. Uh, I call him Jackson. He was an African-American mechanic from Queens. And he had been shot, and there was a bullet lodged in his leg. And the area surrounding the bullet was infected. And when I was peering over to see him, I had a team of medical students and residents with me. And one of them handed me a piece of paper, which revealed the results of a microbiological test. And when I looked at it, my eyes bulged, because it showed that the bacterium that was in his leg was a superbug. It had become resistant to every antibiotic that we had at our disposal except for one. And that one was something called colistin. I don't know if there are any clinicians in the room or pharmacists, but colistin is a very strong antibiotic that was discovered more than a generation ago. And it was something that we stopped using 25 years ago because it is so toxic. So colistin is really good at destroying uh, bacteria, but it also can destroy your kidneys in the process. It can destroy your brain. It can destroy internal organs. So years ago, we made the decision as doctors to stop using it because it was simply too toxic. But I found myself staring into the eyes of this nervous guy saying, I might have to use this drug which could potentially clear your infection, but might wipe out your kidneys in the process and might put you into di on dialysis, might totally ruin your life because of a skin infection. And so a number of things were round, popping through my head as I was seeing this guy. Uh, one of which was, I'm on the ethics committee, and I found myself dealing with an ethical issue, which is, can I ethically justify treating this guy's infection if I might destroy other organs in the process? One of the other things I was wondering is, why did a stray bullet from Queens have a superbug on it? How did that happen? And then more importantly, why didn't we have any better treatment options for him? So all of this was spinning around in my head and it was in that moment that I decided to write my book. And if you flip through the pages of it, you'll see that anecdote is what begins my story. And from there, what happens? And what happens to Jackson? And it becomes one of many patients who I follow and who I continue to follow. Uh, I gave a talk, uh, not far from here actually, and at, at the end of the talk somebody came up to me and said, hey, remember me? I'm, your, I'm in your book. I had the superbug. You cured me. I said, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if anyone here has seen me before, please raise their hand <laughs> and, and let me know. Um, but what happened was after I saw Jackson, I walked across the hall to my mentor. And the reason that I am known as the yeast infection guy is that I trained with the world expert in yeast infections. It's a guy named Tom Walsh, and he is an expert in infectious diseases, pediatrics, 
hematology, oncology, pathology, and fungal infections. And I met him a dozen years ago and immediately decided this is the guy who I want to work with. And when I went into his office that day after seeing Jackson, he had this big smile on his face and he said, I've got an opportunity for us. And really, Matt, it's an opportunity for you. And that opportunity was to run a clinical trial with a new antibiotic that had just been approved by the FDA. It's a drug called Dalbavancin. And the reason we were going to study it is that our hospital, like many hospitals around the country, was in a standoff with the maker of that antibiotic. It was this really powerful new drug that could cure a superbug infection, many superbug infections. But the company said, we're going to charge $4,000 a dose. And my hospital said, thank you, but no thank you. And that was the standoff. So we weren't carrying it. And that led me on this quest to understand how did we get to this point? One of the biggest misconceptions about superbugs is that we're running out of antibiotics. But this isn't true. There's antibiotics being approved by the FDA all the time. There was a new antibiotic approved last month called Cefidrocol. My hospital doesn't carry it. It's not going to carry it. I guarantee you your hospital doesn't either. And we're going to talk about why that is and what's being done about it, because there's a lot being done about it. Um, there are one of, one of the most exciting things about working with superbugs is that every day is full of discovery. People are discovering new antibiotics all the time, and I help figure out whether they should continue studying it and what patients will need it most. And that's the thrill of doing this job. Those two discoveries, back to back, of penicillin and sulfa drugs, ushered in, in the 1950s, what we call the golden era of drug development. The 1950s was a period where every few months a new antibiotic hit the market. Life expectancy blossomed. There was all of these new discoveries hitting the market, new antibiotics every three months. And it seemed like the possibilities were limitless. That story is actually one you may have heard in grade school. It's one that has been told to a lot of people. But what hasn't been taught is what happened after that golden era. And that's where a lot of the research for my book came. If there was so much optimism and so much wonderful discoveries, why are we in this situation with superbugs? Part of that begins in the 1960s, when a number of prominent scientists, including Nobel laureates, came out and said, you know, we got this infectious disease issue kicked. We should start focusing on other conditions, like heart disease, like cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry, the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry at that time, took their cues from these scientists and said, OK, you think there's more we could be doing with heart disease and cancer and diabetes and eye disease? OK. And so they started aggressively making new drugs to help people with those conditions. And it turned out it was very profitable. And it wasn't until, and, and I can tell you how powerful that shift was. In the 1970s and 80s, there were no new classes of antibiotics created. We still had the, the marvelous ones that were discovered in the 50s, but we weren't looking ahead. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we began to appreciate the scope of this problem. In the 1990s, we started seeing superbugs. We started seeing bacteria that had been mutating all along, kind of under cover, behind our backs, while we weren't looking. And the way this happens is every time a human takes an antibiotic, let's say there's a trillion bacteria living in your body, in your colon. You take a Z-Pak for a sinus infection. 50% of those bacteria, let's say 80% of those bacteria will survive. But a small portion of them will mutate. And they'll mutate in a way to become resistant to that Z-Pak the next time you take it. And these bacteria are constantly evolving all the time so that the more antibiotics they see, they see, the more resistant they become. So in the 1990s, we started doing all these surveys and looking at the ground, looking at the hospitals, and saying, whoa, we have a lot of superbugs. We need the pharmaceutical industry to start making new antibiotics. You know what they said? Not sure we want to. There were a number of studies which came out that showed that when a pharmaceutical company invests in a new antibiotic, they typically lose $50 million. Now, why would that be? People need antibiotics. 
Well, think about a doctor like me. Let's compare an antibiotic to a blood pressure drug. If I see you in my office, I'll say, here, take, your blood pressure is high. Take this pill once a day, every day for the rest of your life. That is a great business model. Compare it to an antibiotic, which I'm going to be stingy about doling out. I'm only going to give to you in short courses. And even that wonderful antibiotic is eventually going to encounter drug-resistant microbes, which render it useless. So the pharmaceutical companies are looking at the finances and saying, I know you guys want us to make new antibiotics, but what's in it for us? Every once in a while, they make a blockbuster drug, but by and large, it's not worth it. So this brings me to the second point that I want you to remember from today, which is that there are a lot of new proposals that are on the table to entice the pharmaceutical industry to start making antibiotics again. You haven't heard about these yet, but you're going to start hearing about these both at the local level and at, on the level of presidential debates and beyond. This is going to be a major issue moving forward. So the first thing is called a push incentive. And I'll give you an example. In my book, I chose to write about this one particular antibiotic called Dalbavancin. It's made by a pharmaceutical company called Allergan, which is a Dublin-based pharmaceutical company. So Allergan also makes Botox. Botox had $3 billion in sales last year. You can go to a company like Allergan, which is very good at making antibiotics if they want to, but they're losing interest, and say, you know, your corporate tax rate is 18%. What if we cut it to 15%, provided that you promise to invest a portion of those excess profits into new antibiotics? How do people feel about that? I can tell you that I have mixed emotions. I work very closely with the pharmaceutical industry, trying to figure out strategically what drugs they should develop to meet the needs of our patients. You know, when I first heard about it, I was following the trials in Oklahoma of Johnson & Johnson uh, and other companies that had misled the public about the opioid epidemic. The idea of giving them a tax cut wasn't all that uh, great of an idea to my mind, but on the other hand, it's a surefire way to get these companies to do this. Then there's something called a pull incentive. A pull incentive is to go to a company like Allergan and say, when you develop a new antibiotic and it gets approved for use by the FDA, you typically get five to seven years of market exclusivity, which means that no generic can go on the market, nobody can compete with you, it's just yours alone. Well, rather than giving you five to seven years, what if we gave you 25 years? So that if you put in the effort to get a drug approved, typically a billion dollar investment, we're gonna really reward you handsomely. Well, this idea of market exclusivity is a really powerful one. I'll give you an example. Allergan, the company I work with, also makes Restasis, which is an eye drug. And they had an idea recently this is publicly available knowledge. But the patent lawyers at Allergan said they cooked up a, a, a scheme where they discovered that there's something called tribal sovereign immunity, which is that if a Native American tribe owns a patent, no one else can compete with it. So Allergan decided to transfer their patent to Restasis, to a Native American tribe because they were about to go up against generic competitors with the idea that they would split the profits. I had mixed emotions about this as well. Thought they were exploiting a group that had already been exhaustively exploited. And when I asked people about it, I got very different responses. The doctors I work with said, that's crazy. But patent lawyers I know say, that was brilliant. But ultimately, a judge threw this out and said, this goes against the spirit of the law. But I share that with you because these push and pull incentives, which affect things like market exclusivity, are really powerful. And this is not a debate that has entered the public sphere yet, but it's something that we in infectious disease and in the clinician community, we argue about ad nauseum in um, uh, academic meetings. So that's the only the first half of the debate, which is to say, should we do push and pull incentives for these companies that could potentially help us? Then there is an emerging argument which says if these companies don't want to make treatments for superbugs, well, good riddance. The federal government should do it. 
We should look at antibiotics the way we look at electricity and water, that these are public goods. That what we should really do is disentangle dollars and cents, disentangle profit from this whole idea, this whole mess, and just pool our resources. We could pool it with the European Union, with Australia, whoever else wants to be a part of it, and spend money on the most promising drugs so that we all can benefit from them. And this whole idea of trying to beg these pharmaceutical companies to make new drugs for us is crazy. Now, I travel around the country and around the world, frankly, talking about this idea. And I have found a wide variety of responses to it. I can tell you that I was against it when I first heard about it. And in my book, I, I interview people, uh, people at the National Institute of Health, people in the federal government to say, this is a provocative idea, what do you think? The first person I interviewed was a guy named Tony Fauci. He's the head of the NIAID, part of the New National Institute of Health that sets priorities in infectious diseases. You've probably seen him during the, when we had the congressional testimony about the Ebola outbreak. You've probably seen him talking about Wuhan virus. He's a very smart guy. And I said, what do you think? Should we have the federal government make antibiotics? He said, definitely not. You do not want the federal government to be a pharmaceutical company. And I said, well, why is that? And he explained to me, which I will relay to you, his thoughts on this, that for the last 30 years, we have had a public-private partnership where the NIH, the federal government, is very good at selecting scientists and giving them multi-million dollar grants to do their science, to make discoveries, to find molecules that could potentially be antibiotics. But after those molecules are discovered, things become very risky and very complicated. Let's say that I was in my laboratory doing an experiment and I find you could pick a chemical, zinc oxide. If I find that zinc oxide kills superbugs, well, I can't just start giving it to humans. I have to do all kinds of experiments in test tubes and then in animals, typically two different types of animals. Often we use mice and we use New Zealand white rabbits. Then you do studies in humans phase one trials in humans, which are healthy human volunteers, then phase two trials to see if the drug actually works, and then phase three trials, which are what we call the pivotal trial, which says, does your new discovery, say zinc oxide, better than the existing stuff on the market? That whole process typically takes at least 10 years and a billion dollars of investment. Right now, the way it works is our government invests in scientists to make that discovery, and then those scientists pair off with the private pharmaceutical companies who put the money down for the billion dollar investment. Nine out of 10 of those investments fail. So best case scenario is that a company needs to invest $10 billion to get one of those discoveries to work. And when they do, they want a return on their investment, which is why I was in a standoff with Allergan about their $4,000 a dose drug. None of this was apparent to me, despite the fact that I had studied molecular biophysics in college, went to Harvard Medical School, did my training at Columbia Presbyterian, and I had been a faculty member at New York Presbyterian. But I decided that this was a really interesting thing to look at. How were we going to do this? And so I set about designing a clinical trial, which I found to be much more difficult than I ever expected. And that's what my book ends up being about. Now that we know that these antibiotic-resistant and drug-resistant microbes are in our environment, what are we doing to find new treatments? And there's two things I want to talk about. The first is phage therapy. I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but this is a fascinating new development. If you're keeping, taking notes, phage is P-H-A-G-E, phage, which is short for bacteriophage. So, over close to 100 years ago, it was discovered that there are these naturally occurring viruses called bacteriophages, some people pronounce them phage, I say phage, which can cause bacteria to explode. 
And there was a lot of t work in the 1970s and 80s, mostly in Eastern Europe, places like Lithuania and Latvia, where they were developing bacteriophage therapy to treat infections. But for whatever reason, it just kind of fell by the wayside. But we have found that it's coming back. And it came back in a big way in May of this year, a month after the Candida auris story hit. And I'll say that the Candida, we'll get back to the Candida auris in a minute, but just to say chronologically, the next big thing to happen with superbugs was the return of bacteriophage. And the way this works was exemplified in the treatment of a 15-year-old girl from London who had an infection in her lung with a superbug called Mycobacterium abscessus. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that this girl had gone through two years of antibiotic treatment <clears throat> without cure. And they had cured her using phage therapy. And the way they did it was with something called CRISPR. People familiar with CRISPR? It is an enzyme. I don't want to get this into be a science lesson, but there are certain things that you can, I think, take away from and, and go dig deeper into. And one of them is CRISPR, which is C-R-I-S-P-R. CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that allows us to chop up DNA. And it allowed us to chop up this phage treatment. And so they created three phages. They gave them to a girl, and they cured her. Success. And I was immediately asked to comment on this. And they said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, I think I'm very happy for this girl. But the problem with phage therapy is that it is incredibly narrow spectrum. What I mean by that is that when people try to develop new antibiotics, they want broad spectrum. They want an antibiotic that can broadly treat every bacterium in this room, every infection you may have. They don't want something that can only treat you. But that's essentially what phage therapy does. It's essentially personalized medicine. It's precision medicine. But there's a downside to that, which is that someone has to study it to make sure it's safe. These things, we don't know much about them. I certainly wouldn't give it to my own mother, yet. And the question is, who's going to take up investing billions of dollars in something that could only treat, let's say, mycobacterium obsessus affects a few hundred people a year? The finance has become very thorny, and it looks to be a place, potentially, where the federal government could pick up the slack. If you're somebody who's out there who likes having the government involved in your health care, this would be a great opportunity for them to do more. So phage therapy, is, and there's a book about this um, called The Perfect Predator, about a woman whose uh, husband was saved using phage therapy. And I will say that that is something that we're going to be hearing more about in 2020 and beyond. But there's something else that's even more exciting about where we're looking for the next cures for superbugs. And that's in the soil beneath our feet. This will be point number five that I'd like you to take away from this, which is that the soil is an incredible place for antibiotic discovery. Why would that be? Well, if you recall what I told you about Alexander Fleming, that what he discovered was that there was this fungus that was making a chemical, secreting a chemical into the environment that could kill bacteria. Well, it turns out that in the soil beneath our feet, there are trillions of microbes in every square meter of soil that are engaged in a subterranean warfare, survival of the fittest, where they are all secreting little chemicals. Some of those chemicals are designed to kill others. Some of those chemicals are designed to find like-minded microbes, something called quorum sensing where a bacteria will submit a, send out a little chemical that will identify other bacteria that are similar to it. But the thing we're interested in are the bacteria that are secreting chemicals that are designed to kill other bacteria. Because if you think about it, if we can pluck one of those out, we've got ourselves an antibiotic. And so what we're doing, largely at the Rockefeller University in Manhattan, is we're using artificial intelligence to try to identify where we should hunt for more antibiotics. And as a proof of principle, one of the researchers I work with, a guy named Sean Brady, he asked people to send in soil from Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And he collected the samples, 
and he found more than two dozen new drugs. It's incredible. The question is, what do you do with those findings? Because as I said, any new chemical that you find in the dirt requires at least a billion dollars worth of investment and testing before you know it's safe. And I'll tell you that Sean Brady found in the soil a new drug to treat MRSA. It's called malacidin. If you want to look it up, M-A-L-A-C-I-D-I-N. And he met with me, and he is rapidly producing more malacidin. And I said, great, can I come over to your laboratory and see? And he said, oh, we're making it in China. And I said, okay, well, when you have enough of it, let's test it. Because he's shown that it can kill MRSA. And so what I do is I then would study it in rabbits and in mice and then in humans. And the way we're trying to figure out where that we should look is through artificial intelligence, which really blew my mind when I first heard about this. And the idea is that many of the antibiotics that we use today have similar structures. You ever see the structures a chemist will draw on the board that's got all these stick figures? Well, those are atoms that are separated in space. And what we can do is train a computer to say, okay, so penicillin looks like this. Look for something that looks like this but has a little extra something else on it. And we can rapidly scan through literally tons and tons of soil trying to find things that are, look like the antibiotics that we know are safe and effective, but are a little bit different. And then something interesting happened after we've started this hunt in the soil, is that I was contacted by The Atlantic, which is uh, the, the magazine. And they said, we'd like you to comment on this new in, um, quest led by Craig Venter, the guy who uh, sequenced the human genome. He thinks the next great place to find antibiotics is at the bottom of the ocean. I said, really? That's news to me. But it led me on a quest, and one of the reasons I enjoy doing this is that I learn every day something new. And his theory is that at the bottom of the ocean must be some extraordinary organisms that can live in such harsh environments. And whatever's down there, if we can scoop them up and bring them back, they've probably got something important to tell us about survival. It's an interesting idea. I wouldn't want to invest in it, but if a billionaire wants to invest in it, I think it's a reasonable approach. We're also looking in the tundra. People are going to the Arctic, the Antarctic, and looking to see, is there anything alive deep down in the ice? And this is one of the, I think, wonderful stories about superbugs and about life is that it finds a way. And we're trying to learn from everything around us how can we figure out ways for our species to survive, learning from some that are able to survive for thousands of years? And I know people have a lot of questions about this stuff. And while you're thinking about your questions, I'll tell you and wrap up some of the loose ends that I've started with um, in my story. I began with that patient, Jackson, who had been shot. He ended up getting colistin and it gradually deteriorated his kidneys. Eventually, we found that the antibiotic wasn't working, and his bacterium became resistant to colistin. And at that point, we reached essentially what was a pre-antibiotic era. We had no other treatments for him, and we had to surgically remove the infection. And that's what we did in the pre-antibiotic era. We cut things out. Think about biting the bullet and cutting off someone's leg. That was because they had an infected lesion on their leg and we didn't want it to leach into the blood. Because when infection gets into the blood, that's when problems result. Because it can go to the heart, the brain, the kidneys, the liver, and be a big problem. I also want to tell you what happened with the, the antibiotic. So this antibiotic had been approved, Dalbavancin, in 2014. And my hospital said, we're never going to use it, it's too expensive. I ran this trial, the one that I write about in my book, and I don't want to give away too much, but it was such an extraordinary result that my hospital convened a special meeting and unanimously approved it. And it was a bittersweet moment for me. It was, I was happy 
because we were adding this new drug, but I was frustrated that it took years of study and wasted time and effort. And I thought about all the patients who hadn't had access to it. And that process highlighted yet another challenge for antibiotic makers, which is that when they finally get their drug approved by the FDA, it's not like every hospital suddenly takes it up and says, okay, we're gonna use this now. They have something called a formulary committee. The formulary committee looks at things like dollars and cents and they buy in bulk. So if there are two similar antibiotics, they could go to both companies and say, make us a deal. That means that a lot of antibiotics don't end up on your formulary, which is different than for heart disease or cancer. When a new heart disease drug comes out, we add it. When a new cancer drug comes out, we add it. Part of that has to do with the money that we make off of these types of diseases. We don't make much money off of infections. I can tell you, I, I was told not to go into infectious diseases as a field. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times pointing out that no one wants to be an infectious disease doctor anymore. The title that I gave it was, Where Have All the Infectious Disease Doctors Gone? They switched it to make it a little more clicky. It said, The Scary Shortage of Infectious Disease Doctors. I keep that in mind every morning when I read the news and I feel dispirited about all of the headlines. And I think, well, if they change my headline to make it sound scarier, I'm probably doing that for literally every other article that I'm going to read today. And I just try to keep that in mind that I'm much happier when I'm thinking that someone's trying to manipulate me. <laughs> because I don't think the world's as bad as it seems when I'm reading the news. And then I'll add, I want to add another thing about, so Dalba Vanson got approved, and that opened up a new pathway for me to do research. All of these companies started coming to me and saying, hey, can you get my drug on the formulary? And that put me in an ethically uh, perilous position because I don't want to be some shill for, the for, the, for the, the, these companies. But they're very nervous, the ones that make antibiotics. And they point to a company called Achaeogen. This is point number six if you want to look up. Achaeogen is A-C-H-A-O-G-E-N. They make an antibiotic called plazomycin. P-L-A-Z-O-M-I-C-I-N. Which was approved by the FDA in June of this past year. Sorry, of June of 2018. To tremendous fanfare. People said, we've got a new drug for superbugs. Nine months later, the company was bankrupt. And the reason for that is when the FDA approves a new drug for superbugs, they don't give it blanket approval and say, you can use plazomycin for whatever you want. They give it for specific indications like a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia or a bloodstream infection. And these companies gamble heavily on what they're going to get approval for. And they gambled wrong. It was approved for urinary tract infections, and we don't need a new drug for that. Stock price plummeted. Company went bankrupt. Three months after the company went bankrupt, the World Health Organization added plazomycin to the list of essential medicines. So this company invested a billion dollars to make a drug that the WHO thinks is essential, and they couldn't make a single dollar off of it. Which leads credence, lends credence to the idea that maybe these companies shouldn't be doing this at all. I'm not going to weigh in on that. You can read my book and you can see what you think about that argument. But you will be hearing more about this idea that the federal government should be the one who's looking after you and looking after in the whole field of infectious diseases and antibiotics.